Have you ever heard of calypso music? It's a fusion genre that blends African, French, Creole, and Carnival influences into this jazzy, Afro-Caribbean dance music. It laid the groundwork for the reggae movement, and I think its influence can still be felt today. Whether you want to talk about Rihanna, who's actually from Barbados, or groups like Vampire Weekend, the latest band in a long line of Western artists appropriating and fetishizing African music. And while Calypso is not an umbrella term to describe the many different Afro-Caribbean styles, it is my personal favorite. And in this video I'll be demonstrating how the genre plays into the modern musical landscape of today, and the larger historical context of Westerners importing African culture. Be sure to tell your people that the purpose of our ceremonies is not entertainment, but attainment. I had a little dream the other night, and it filled me with Trinidad, yeah, world greatest musician. They know my beats, and they hear the sweet. Man, when I drop the notes, they're calling for high notes. It was my beat that gave trouble on the streets. I know they address me. Dipping, dipping, ding, 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 ding. Like a majesty. Ding, 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 ding. They say me music sweet and it made for the pants to be. <laughs> the calypso rhythm is kind of Latin rhythm, which is not that popular for the, to the foreign market. The foreign market would go more for it. For fourth time, the pop time. Even Calypso can be sung in that timing. But because Calypso is sung in this particular timing. Notice the emphasis on triplets. The, the foreigner might like to hear it but he can't get with it and get into it. The foreigner is not so acquainted to this type of beat. To us it is sweet. We love it. The man being interviewed is Lord Kitchener. He was considered one of Calypso's biggest stars, with an astonishing 36 albums to his name in a career that spanned 40 years. His real name was Alduin Roberts, and he was born in Trinidad and Tobago in 1922, where he was discovered as a teenager by fellow Calypsonian Growling Tiger. While the right. show was going on, Alduin Roberts came and told me that he would like to sing. I asked Mr. Robert if what was his name was a Calypsonian. He told me he didn't have any. I said, well, I will call you Lord Kitchener. Come go to bed, I have a small comb to scratch your head and do the kitch. Don't make me cry, you know I love you, you plain shy. Well, the people went crazy over that song. They thought it was very sexy and things like that. And then they started coming to the club in the hundreds. Things started working good for me. Lord Kitchener, now I'm told that you are really the king of Calypso singers, is that right? Yes, that's well, so sing for us? Right now. Yes. London is the place for me. A lot of Calypsonians had songs about London. London, this lovely city. And it's no surprise when you consider the fact that after World War II, there was a large-scale migration of Caribbeans to England, including Kitchener himself. Australia, but you must come back. In the wake of the war and the height of racial segregation in the U.S., it's easy to understand why London must have seemed like an ideal place to pursue a better life. Another American dream, so to speak. I've been traveling to countries years ago, but this is the place I wanted to know. London, that's the place for me. But let me go back for a second, because Calypso didn't start with Lord Kitchener. I can't explain it all in this video, but the history extends back to the inhumane conditions faced by the Abibio slaves from Nigeria, who would use cleverly concealed political subtext to sing about their masters. And through the slave trade, this form of music called queso became blended with a form of French steel pan music called cambule, and thus this new, popular form of calypso was born, which appealed to people both black and white. And yet somehow, tragically, these singers were still slaves, and even those who had gained their freedom were often banned from celebrating the yearly harvest festivals. Calypso was not recognized as it is today. As a matter of fact, 
the people look down on Calypso and Steel Man. If you are a Negro, you can plainly see that you're bound to suffer misery and tyranny. If you are a Negro, you can plainly see that you're bound to suffer misery and tyranny. But we all should be responsible and always be living in unity and tranquility. For God made us all, and in Him we trust. Nobody in this world is better than us. Calypso music became the most prominent in Trinidad and Tobago. This is not only where Lord Kitchener was born, but also Lord Invader, Attila the Hun, and Roaring Lion. Roaring Lion, or Rafael de Leon, is another major figure in Calypso history. His 65-year career began in the early 30s, where he became famous for his ability to extemporize lyrics on any subject, much like freestyle rapping. This fast-paced and almost conversational vocal style became a major component of Calypso, and carried over into soca and even reggae music. But it wasn't a rule, and often Calypso music was slow and laid back. I admit the fella may be a good singer, but to be a Calypsoonian you must be a composer. Tackling any topic come to hand, you call yourself a true, true Calypsoonian. At its height, Calypso music became so self-referential that it often became used as a literal source of news that people relied on. Most of dominating the world Well take the sip and behave for England Mistress the land and the wave And it still always maintained its emphasis on social commentary. Despite British censorship, the Calypsonians would sneak double entendres into the lyrics, they would spark shock and outrage, touching on local news, politics, gossip, sex, and scandal. Well, if it's so, I don't want to be a monkey, neither a goat, a sheep, or donkey. My brother say he want to come back a hug, but I'm spoiler. I want to be a bed bugger just because I want to bite them young ladies' partner, like a hot dog or a hamburger. And if you know your sin, don't be in a fright. It's only big fat women that are going to bite. <laughs> Jumping forward a bit, one of the next big Calypso stars was Harry Belafonte, and he incorporated a bit more crooner into his Calypso. But I'm sad to say I'm on my way, won't be back for many a day. His 1965 album Calypso was the first album of its kind to sell a million copies. Okay, but first I just want to talk about the way this guy photographs for a second. Like, look at that. Look at that scowl. I mean, I don't know anyone who has that body language or a relationship to the camera that's that intense. That's too much. Anyways, he has a bunch of songs you'd probably recognize. My favorite is Jump in the Line. And when she dances, oh brother, she's a hurricane in all kinds of weather. Jump in the line, rock your body on time. Okay, I believe you jump in the line, rock your body on time. Okay. I believe you it was his more commercialized form of Calypso that ushered in its golden era, where Calypso was finally considered a mainstream genre, both in the Caribbean, the British Empire, and even at home in America. White singers like the Kingston Trio began folkifying Calypso standards. We come on this loop, John B. My grandfather and me. Around us our town we did roam. And thus begins the long and complex history of white appropriation of Caribbean and West African music. Now here all the fish is happy, as off through the waves they roll. The fish on the land ain't happy, it's hot cause they in the bowl. Reggae and ska influence started cropping up all over the place. I like the thing that happened in Jamaica okay. called reggae. It happened a few, there's a music in Jamaica called reggae, which has been around for years under the disguise of ska, blue beats, etc, etc, but finally formed itself into reggae, and that's about the really newest thing that's happened in music in the last five years. Using heavy chorus effect on the guitar was one specific characteristic lifted from African music that you can still hear in indie music today. As far as I can tell, this type of funky, mathy guitar style was first used by the 1970s group The Green Arrows from Zimbabwe. Pretty cool, right? Animal Collective's A.V. Terror has often cited this kind of African guitar music among his influences. And then there's these guys again. 
And there's so many people my age who think Vampire Weekend invented that sound. They just call it peppy and tropical sounding without realizing it's based on something real. But the truth is, I really love Animal Collective, and they're hardly the worst offenders. I guess what I'll be saying is there ain't no better reason Knocked on your door with heart in my head To ask you a question And to be totally transparent, I had a band in college that used the fuck out of the Afro-Caribbean beat. Good times. So there are countless examples of borrowed musical devices, but I think you get the point. Let's bring it back to classic Calypso for a second. This is Calypso Rose, who was instrumental in bringing back traditional style Calypso in the late 80s. Talking about Calypso in 2017 America is a tricky thing, especially in our current internet age, where it seems like anyone can sample or even copy old music. All I know is that I truly enjoy the music. And I find the more and more I can understand about the history and context of it, I actually enjoy it more. I'll let the true kings of Calypso have the final word. Complaining of a leak in Shimofila. The soaker, be a stronger beat with less lyrics. Friends, I wonder if you really know mm. how hard it mm. is to present mm. your own guys. So mm. You are to get an idea, mm. then a good composition mm. with sweet music and proper mm. rendition. Mm. After you finish all mm. that, you still mm. not at ease. Mm. You have a demanding audience to please. You are to always come good by public demand to be accepted as a true, true Calypsonian.